Regulating development is a puzzle with many sides and combinations. In this lecture, we move to, talk, to taking the perspective of regulators. So this is the third in three lectures on the planning framework in Queensland. We started with planning schemes. We've looked at the development assessment system. I want to move now to looking at conditions and development offences. And I've restructured this lecture because I, I originally recorded it with a lot of technical details at the start and I felt that that bogged, bogged us down. I want to instead restructure the lecture into four stories, four storylines, and draw out principles and important lessons at the end based on those four stories, because I think one of the challenges with this topic for people who haven't worked in the development assessment system is understanding its importance, how fundamentally significant conditions are, and not getting caught up in the, the technical rules and missing the practical importance about what's going on in relation to them and in development offences. And I think it's better to start with four stories and tease out issues. It'll bring home to you much more how significant these topics are and hopefully bring home to you the practical reality of many of the issues around development offences and conditions. So the four stories are one about, uh, I call it Pelican Links preemptive clearing, another story about Brisbane City Council prosecution for unlawful development and land use, a fisheries prosecution for mangrove clearing is the third story, and then the fourth story is a recent case in the Planning and Environment Court involving Sincere International and Gold Coast City Council. So broadly, those four stories are covering two big issues. What can a regulator do if an offence occurs? And secondly, what conditions can a regulator impose on an approval? And as I said, I'm going to deal with, leave really the technical issues and rules about condition making powers to the end. I think they make a lot more sense once you've seen some examples of what happens in the real world. Okay, so our first story is the Pelican Lynx preemptive clearing litigation. So Pelican Lynx is a golf course in Caloundra, so about an hour's drive north of Brisbane. And if we focus in on Caloundra, so if you drive into Caloundra, you have to go, before you get into town, you have to turn south and go down to Pelican Lynx. And there's a series of uh, canals that have been built in that area. And it's also just to explain the regional context. So this is Bribe Island, which is a lovely sand island just off the coast. and in between Bribe Island and the mainland is Palmerstone Passage, which has got incredible fisheries values. It's part of a Ramsar wetland, so it's that's an internationally significant uh, wetland for international migratory species. For the last few decades, the local government has been basically trying to stop further development sprawling south and impacting upon the natural values and the fisheries habitat values around Palmerston Passage. So if I focus in on uh, the Pelican Lynx golf course, so uh, a couple of decades ago a canal estate was approved uh, in the area and so canal estate is here. So the benefits of a canal estate for, from a development perspective are you buy land that's low-lying in coastal area, flood prone, you can normally buy it very cheaply and uh, so you buy this land cheaply and then you get approval to dig out big canals and you use the fill from the canals. So the mud that you dig out, you then use to raise up the land around the canals and then build houses on them or whatever you're building, but typically houses. And so you take low value land and you turn it into high value land because now you've got all of this waterfront land with houses that are raised up away from the tide and uh, less uh, liable to flooding. And it's a great, great if you can do it, um, worth a lot of money and have been very popular in uh, Queensland, in Australia and elsewhere in the world, but come with tremendous environmental impacts. So uh, there's a whole range of issues with them, but significant impacts on fisheries, um, in these areas, there it's particularly prone to what are called acid sulfate soils, uh, 
which are soils that have been or basically mud that's been deoxygenated for a long time so no oxygen in it and if you dig it up or you drain it and expose it to oxygen there's a chemical reaction that from the pyrite in the in the mud that produces uh, acidic conditions that so produces a lot of acid and if you do it on a big scale like you drain a big area or you dig out big canal estates there can be an enormous amount of acid produced and you change the pH of the water. When you do that, you can mobilize uh, heavy metals that are naturally bound up in the clays. You can mobilize them into the, into the water column so they go from being basically inert and bound and then into the water column. So uh, if you mobilize aluminium and those sorts of things, will it pretty well kill anything with gills. So uh, acid sulfate soils need to be carefully managed. There's also habitat loss whole range of issues with canal estates but uh, for all of their problems they're still popular it's still a very very valuable development if you can do it so this area has had significant canal estates built and ongoing development of canal estates and if i focus in on um, this red circle notice this creek here it's called bell creek and essentially council was trying to stop any further development south of Bell Creek so and keep it basically natural or, or agricultural fisheries sort of values south of Bell Creek. So if I focus in, you can see Bell Creek a little bit there on the left. Essentially what uh, was involved was there'd been a development in the 90s which had established a, this residential housing estate with canals and a golf course. and then in the mid 2000s an area was preemptively cleared and I'll, I'll tell you more about that with some pictures in a moment but just to give you the context under the planning scheme at the time the Cloundra city plan the area was designated as open space and it was intended for yeah golf course but also for conservation and waterways and what council was trying to do was keep the residential development up uh, f as far away from Bell Creek as possible and so transition into a more natural or agricultural area and protect the fisheries values of that, that area and Pummelstone Passage. So that's at a planning scale what council was trying to do but the landowner saw the, the profit to be made in developing that land which uh, essentially was um, wooded um, relatively low value if it just remained as a golf course and woodland and what they were trying to do was essentially establish a big residential area with a hotel and units uh, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of development if not billions and so that was the plan of what was proposed if you just keep in in your eye this um, lake area here because it's uh, this same sort of shape is there that's that lake so here you can see the lake and then you can get a reference for what basically was proposed a whole heap of residential and hotel development uh, right up to Bell Creek. So this is a comparison of the map with the Google Earth image and you can see that lake that I referred to is there and here's the lake. So essentially all of this wooded area was proposed to be developed by um, the landowner. What happened was that an area in the north was preemptively cleared before putting in a development application for it. And the intention from the developer was clearly to pretty well clear all of it and remove a lot of its natural values because they, they were going to be difficult things to get. It was going to be difficult to get approval to remove those given the planning context in council wanting to basically stop further development going south and in, enhance the natural values of that area and the fisheries values. So the developer thought, well, let's get in and clear it. This is just a couple more maps. Uh, there's a, a housing lots were proposed. There's that lake again, and then housing lots proposed here, and then hotels and condominiums proposed down in the south and another precinct map. So here's the chronology. The original development occurred in the 90s and there was a development approval granted for the golf course subject to conditions. In 97 to 98, the golf course was constructed but the western section was left largely undeveloped. Then in 2004, a company that um, had acquired the land 
met with council officers to discuss clearing the undeveloped western section and council basically said no we don't want that we we want to retain those areas for conservation for fisheries values for for we don't want essentially the the city to keep creeping south the developer assured council that no clearing would take place without council approval but then a month later basically clearing of land occurred without notice to council I'll come back to this condition, but essentially there was a condition in the development approval that was a key to Council's actions from there. Well, what happened was on the 21st of July 2004, uh, a complaint came from the public to Council to say that there was clearing on the land. And this is a quote or some, an extract from a court case about it that resulted from the clearing. So. Mr. Deenan, an Environment Compliance Officer with Council, received a notification from a member of the public of suspected unlawful tree clearing occurring to the west of Pelican Waters Golf Club. He went to the golf club at around 10.30 a.m. When he arrived, he was approached by a security officer. He told the person who he was and that he was investigating a complaint of tree clearing. The security officer refused him permission to enter the site and he had to leave. He then though it didn't give up at that point. And this is where you cheer for the initiative shown by the council. He then went off to the local airfield and ordered a helicopter charter and he and other council officers overflew the site at about 2.15 p.m. He took photographs of what he saw. These are some of the pictures. So that lake that I referred to before, that's here. And Caloundra's in the distance. I know this image is quite blurry. It was given to me by council. I haven't been able to get a better version of it, but. Um, you can make out essentially the broad, broadly what's going on. So in the foreground is where the clearing was occurring. So this, this is taken by the council officer overflying the site at about 2.30 in the afternoon. And there's some bulldozers uh, that you'll see in the next few pictures. So here's one of those bulldozers. Here's that lake again. And here's where the clearing is going on. So close up of the bulldozer in action. I know it's blurry, but you can basically see these trees that have been pulled down and then the trees that haven't yet been pulled down, but obviously are about to be pulled down by the bulldozers. Here's another image taken from the helicopter. You can see some cars there, the trees down. Uh, this is a picture I took in 2010, just looking back across the canal estate. So I went there and in the first year I taught uh, this course, I uh, took a class there and that was the site that we were developing for the group assignment. The owner of the land in 2010 was happy for us to come and look at it. So we went back to it. Uh, I thought it was such an interesting example of uh, development and unlawful, yeah, basically breaches of the planning scheme. So you can see looking across that lake in the foreground, uh, I took this picture from the hotel that's there and you can see the houses that have been built and you can see how they've been raised up. So essentially that the, the lake, the mud from the lake would have been used to raise up the houses there so they can be built upon. So that's your classic canal estate. Okay, here's another image of the, the hotel that's there. So broad question, well, what laws regulate the activity? So we're in the planning framework, so you can guess, well, it's gonna be something to do with the planning legislation and you're right. If the offence was to occur now, it would be under the regulated under the Planning Act 2016. So two offences that regularly crop up are 163, carrying out accessible development without a permit, and 164, breaching a development approval, including a condition of a development approval. So those are two of the most common offences in the planning context. So has an offence been committed if those same facts occurred today. Um, I just, before I go on to that, I just want to flesh out those sections just a little bit more, just to give you an idea of, well, has an offence occurred and then what are the potential penalties? If I fill in the numbers, so see here how subsection 2 says, subsection 1 does not apply to development carried out under section 29, 46 and 88. So you need to go and cross-reference those sections to know what they are, to know not only if a, this is accessible development, but then if any of the exemptions apply, we could go and look at those and none of them are applicable. 29 deals with development under an old planning scheme, 46 is for an exemption specific with minor development, and 88 is about using security paid under elapsed approval. So they're all quite minor. None of them are applicable in this case. 
So there's no get out of jail free card in subsection two. So if this is accessible development, um, you know, do they have all the necessary permits is the key question for that. And then the the numbers for penalty units that arise, sorry, the, the maximum fines are calculated based on the penalty units. And just to explain what penalty units are, so because there are thousands of offences stated across all of the bits of legislation in Queensland at an, and at a national level, instead of stating a specific amount of money for each offence, like $50,000 or $200,000 or $2 million, given that if you state any number, then over time, it's going to be less and less um, significant because with uh, just natural um, uh, changes in the value of money, uh, it's going to become less and less over time. So to get around that problem, the approach that's taken in, broadly in Australia is to specify a number in penalty units. And then if you need to raise the total amount of penalties because of changes in the value of money over time, you can simply change the value of the penalty units and then it then applies, it raises the maximum fines across all of the hundreds or thousands of offences in one go. So all offences typically state an amount in penalty units. And at the moment, for the last five years or so, a penalty unit has been worth $110. Um, one other little quirk is that if you see a penalty um, stated and there's no particular penalty stated for a corporation, then you take that as a pe maximum penalty for an individual that is a natural person and a corporation's maximum fine is multiplied by five. That just comes from it's a, a, a piece of legislation called the Penalties and Sentences Act, which defines what a penalty unit is worth and also talks about offences for corporations. So um, in this case, let's just ignore the heritage um, issues in uh, paragraph A and just this isn't a, a place that's on a local heritage place or Queensland heritage place. So we're into the otherwise um, maximum penalty, 4,500 penalty units. For an individual, the maximum fine at the moment would be $495,000 and for a corporation would be $2.5 million in round figures. So that's the offence of carrying out accessible development without a permit. But in this case, um, more applicable was breaching a development approval because of a condition that I'll, I'll come back to in, in a moment. So a person must not contravene a development approval. And there's that same maximum penalty again, 4,500 penalty units. Another um, quite common offence is section 165, unlawful use of premises. But this, these facts don't really raise that offence. And some of the other stories I'll tell it in later in the lecture, unlawful use of the premises is relevant, but not really for this one. Okay, so key offence here is section 164. Have they breached their development approval? Have they breached the condition? Basically, the condition uh, in the 1996 approval is stated there, A12 in the, the grey. A12 said no clearing of native vegetation is to occur on the subject development site without the prior written approval of council's environment branch. It will be necessary for the applicant and any subsequent owners to make a formal application, including a plan outlining the reasons for clearing and identifying the impacts of such clearing. So that was the condition that was stated. When uh, all this went down, the developer challenged the validity of that condition on pretty technical grounds. Uh, there's rules that we'll see um, at the end of the lecture for uh, conditions must be final, they must be certain. Um, this condition was attacked for lacking both of those things. It was said to require a further approval from the local government. It was also said to basically not be valid for a number of reasons. I won't get into the technicalities now. But essentially, the Planning Environment Court dismissed that challenge and said, no, it's a valid condition. And then that was went on appeal to the Planning and Environment Court, sorry, to the Court of Appeal, and the Court of Appeal dismissed the appeal. So the condition was upheld, but there was a big challenge to its validity. And the reason for the challenge is really, you know, the, the developer hadn't challenged it back in 1996 when it was imposed, but fast forward to 2004, this condition was a real problem for them. 
and there's hundreds of millions of dollars worth of development riding on whether this condition is valid or not and potentially big fines for the developer so when you've got that sort of money uh, at stake it means that um, developers are you know, well you know happy to go off to court and fight about it because there's a big commercial reason for doing it so you can spend fifty thousand a hundred thousand two million dollars on lawyers to go off to court and have a big fight with council and maybe you win and if you win you get a lot of money so that's this is often just commercial uh, litigation effectively it's there's commercial reasons for challenging that condition so I just want to talk through some of the enforcement options open in, in this case. So let's just say we're at council and we say, well, our condition said you can't clear and you're breaching that condition. That's an offence. What can we do about it? So there's a range of things that regulators can do. Modern environmental laws typically provide many enforcement options for regulators from orders to stop work through to full-blown criminal prosecution. So there's a whole range of tools in modern environmental laws and often it's difficult to know which, which tool to use. And for most large regulators, what they do to try and get consistency, because if you've got dozens or hundreds of staff spread across a large area like Queensland that is enforcing your laws, you want them to do it in a fairly consistent way and in an equitable way. You don't want you know, the investigators in Brisbane to be really strict and the investigators up in Cairns and Townsville to be really lax so that the same offence that occurs in Brisbane gets a big fine and, the, you know, and a, a similar offence that occurs up in Townsville or Cairns, they just turn a blind eye to it. That would be unfair to the, the people in Brisbane that are getting pinged for offences that in other places they get away with. So how do you, as a, as a regulator like so the Department of Environment at a statewide level, how do you get consistency when there's many staff involved, lots of different offices, you've got a big area, lots of different potential offences, lots of different fact scenarios? Well, the typical way that regulators try and do that is by establishing a written policy that sets out criteria and provides guidance for staff in what they should do faced with different fact scenarios. And then they also train their staff and they communicate and you have hierarchies within a department to sign off on enforcement actions so that you try and establish procedures to get consistency across the state. But a major component of that are enforcement policies. So the typical way that enforcement policies work is built around the idea of responsive regulation. And this uh, diagram shows a, a classic enforcement pyramid. It was actually part of the DERM or the Department of Environment and Resource Management Enforcement Guideline back in about 2010. It's no longer part of their guidelines, but it's still a useful diagrammatic uh, representation of what their guidelines now do in words. So basically the idea with this, if you're looking at a prosecution or a potential offence from a regulator's perspective, is that you think about enforcement in a sort of escalating pyramid. So down the bottom, basically you want most people to be in compliance or everyone to be in compliance would be a perfect world so that you don't need to take any enforcement action because everyone's complying with the law. The next step up from that is you use education and warning notices for low-level offences and to basically get people back into compliance. So if you see someone doing something that technically breaches the law but is pretty minor and you think, look, if you, you just educate them by telling them what they're doing is wrong, then that's a, a classic warning. It might be in writing or it might just be orally. So, for instance, if you're doing something wrong and a policeman pulls you over and says, you know, you shouldn't do that, that's a break, breach of the law, I'm not going to give you a ticket now, but if I see you again doing that, you know, turning right without indicating or something, you know, something that's relatively easily fixed, a police person might give you a warning on the spot and, uh, you know, it's an education strategy. Okay, so that's education and warning. The next step up from that is administrative enforcement action that doesn't require them to go to court. And the, the main form of that is penalty infringement notices or PINs, 
is what they're called, um, commonly called tickets. So if you get a traffic ticket, say you were speeding and a policeman pulls you over and writes out a ticket and you get a $500 fine for you know not having a seatbelt on and, and speeding, uh, that's a penalty infringement notice in technical terms. Uh, environmental regulators can have powers to give pins uh, in many different for many different offences. These are small, uh, easily remedied offences that don't warrant going to court and all of the administration with going to court. So pins are widely used. Also, uh, under the Planning Act and under um, environment, other environmental laws, there are powers for regulators to give statutory notices to say, clean up this site or stop doing what you're doing. So in under the Planning Act, the first step is typically a show cause notice, and then that can go on to an enforcement notice. And if you breach an enforcement notice, you can be fined. So those are administrative actions without going to court. The next step up is to go to court in civil proceedings for a declaration or some sort of restraint order. And then above that is a criminal prosecution where you're going for a fine. Now, in many other places, the, the ability to give orders and um, impose fines is fused in the one court. But in Queensland, we still have a separation. Civil proceedings are brought in the Planning Environment Court and criminal prosecutions are brought in the Magistrates Court. and you'll see in a moment why that creates a problem. I'll flesh that out, come back to it. Uh, but how do you decide if, what, which one to use is the question I want to focus on just the moment. How do you decide between taking no action all the way up to criminal prosecution? You've, you've got a discretion. All regulators have a discretion whether to prosecute or not if they see an offence. So for low level things, you might exercise the discretion to say, no, we don't, there's no, we don't need to prosecute here. The classic reference point is called the public interest. So is there a public interest in this offence being prosecuted? So the answer to that isn't, isn't black and white. Um, there's many factors that go into it, but three factors in particular in environmental con context that push you up or push you down the enforcement pyramid are these three, the level of harm to the environment, the fault of the person that's done the offence, and whether they get in and fix things up and they remediate. So I'll just talk that through in the context of the facts here in a moment, but I'll just mention um, as an example, the Department of Environment and Science publishes enforcement guidelines, the most recent version is 2019, and they have two tables where important for what tool to use under things like the Environmental Protection Act, they talk about the level of impact. So the impact of the contravention is dealt with in Table 1, everything from Level 5 with serious impact or risk of impact down to Level 1, low impact or risk of impact, and they give basically criteria around what those things mean. So the seriousness of the impact is a, is a principal consideration in deciding what to do as a regulator. Okay, then there's the culpability or fault of the offender. So serious culpability are intentional willful acts, um, offences that are ongoing or of long duration, where there's misleading conduct, attempts to deceive, those sorts of things. That, that points to serious culpability. Down to low level culpability where it's inadvertent, um, it was short term, they get into remediation. So those are the sorts of things that go into low culpability. So those are the two big criteria in the in the Department of Environment and Science Enforcement Guidelines, which councils like would be Sunshine Coast Regional Council now covers this area where if this offence was to occur now, they have similar sorts of considerations for prosecutions. So that's the enforcement pyramid, a very useful concept to bear in mind when you're looking at um, what action regulators can take and harm, fault and remediation effort are key considerations. So these um, ideas really flow from this broad concept of what's called responsive regulation. It's been widely used around the world. Uh, a really good book um, that I use a lot is by Gunningham and Grabowski um, from 1998, Smart Regulation, Designing Environmental Policy. Really good book if you're interested in designing environmental regulation and, and the like. But yeah, responsive regulation 
comes from that sort of literature, the idea that you don't always have to come down really hard. You can basically tailor your response to the circumstances of the case and also the, the response of the offender. Okay, so in this case, what happened was there was, it ended up having three court cases. Uh, so first off, there was a civil proceeding in the Planning Environment Court. There was also an appeal by the developer against council's refusal for the development application. And there was also a criminal prosecution in the Magistrates Court. And I'll explain why that occurred. Uh, there's details on my website with the website address and then forward slash pelican. So what, what council faced um, when the um, clearing occurred was uh, under the planning legislation, um, there are limited tools for stopping offences that are occurring. Uh, unlike normal criminal law, where if, for instance, if the police caught someone breaking into a house, they could arrest the person. That's the standard thing that police use to stop an offence occurring. You arrest the person, take them off to jail, and they might stay in jail until trial, if it's particularly if it's a serious offence, or they might get bail pending um, the trial. So that's a standard response in your normal criminal um, offences. But in a planning and environment context, rarely do you arrest offenders. Uh, and in, a, and in the planning framework, there's not even a power for the local government to arrest the offenders while they're doing it. So uh, to get a fine, if you want to stop them and get a fine, you have to bring proceedings in the criminal courts, in the magistrate's court in this context. But uh, you won't get a remedy from that court until the outcome of the trial. And that might take six months or 12 months to get a decision um, if you commence the trial now. Um, commence the, the prosecution now, you might not get a decision for six months or 12 months, so the clearing is going to occur. So what do you do to stop you know, an offence like this? Well, one avenue is to go to the Planning and Environment Court, which is a civil, civil jurisdiction, and get an urgent order from the court to stop the offence occurring. So that's what council did in this case, and they raced off to the Planning and Environment Court, got an order that afternoon for them to stop the clearing and then they raced back to the developer and gave it to them on site and the clearing was stopped that afternoon and then basically the the um, enforcement order that was given by the planning environment court was based on the condition that council had imposed in the earlier approval that then led to the litigation which went on to the court of appeal that i talked about before where the developer was arguing that the condition was invalid and the council won that, but they used the planning and environment court procedure to stop the clearing occurring. And that's basically like bringing back a bazooka and pointing it at the, the developer and saying, you know, stop now or we're going to basically blow you up. Because while there's not a power to arrest uh, someone for a breach of a planning act, um, as soon as you've got an order from a court... If someone breaches that, it becomes contempt of court, which itself is a criminal offence and or can be civil, it can be criminal, but in this sort of context where it's intentional, it would be regarded as criminal. The police can then come and arrest someone based on contempt of court and so you and also there's no limit on the fine that can be imposed. So it becomes a very, very big offence. Um, quickly so you, you're bringing in you're wheeling in the big guns if you go off and get a enforcement order so that was the first litigation then what the developer did was lodge an application for the development of the houses that it wanted to um, build and the houses in the hotel and council refused that and then the developer appealed to the planning environment court against council's refusal ultimately the planning environment court um, rejected the appeal so council won then council decided that it also wanted to fine the um, the company so it commenced a criminal prosecution in the magistrate's court but the developer managed to convince the magistrate that the condition was invalid and the magistrate dismissed the prosecution the council then appealed that to the district court and the district court overturned that decision and sent it back to the magistrate's magistrate's court but the 
um, by that time the company had gone into liquidation and the council didn't proceed so there was never ultimately there wasn't a fine imposed for the clearing so that sounds really convoluted and it is I just wanted to tell you about it to give you and to well, tell you the story of what occurred and then how how much litigation resulted from it and how problematic these issues can be it's really, these are really hard and from a developer's perspective you can see that what they're trying to do is get a big pot of there's a big pot of gold if they win in this because the development itself is worth hundreds of millions of dollars so if you can clear you get in and clear the site and then you get a fine for say five million dollars if that's but you can still then if that you still can do the development well your five million dollars really is just small change for the hundreds of millions of dollars of profit you make so stopping them from clearing the site was critical and the strong action taken by council in this case was really exemplary in basically you know holding back uh, a developer and, and stopping them trying to get big commercial profits council then had to res to respond to an appeal by a developer again there's a big pot of gold for the developer if they win that appeal no pot of gold for council all council gets from defending these cases or bringing these cases is that its planning scheme is upheld and that the integrity of you know the protection of the environment in its local government area and and the like is achieved there's no hundreds of millions of dollars that council makes so yeah those three court proceedings illustrate a lot of issues related to offenses land development and the whole question of you know how um, important it is to have strong regulation so just as a postscript the case occurred in 2004 so there's a picture of the site. Um, here's an image in 2007 of the area that was preemptively cleared. This is an image from 2008 with the area regrowing. Basically, Council won these court cases and basically uh, the orders of the court allowed the trees to regrow on the site. So this was the site in 2010 with a picture I took when I, I went there. You can see the trees that weren't cleared, the tall trees on the right. And I'm just standing in the area that was cleared, taking a picture of the regrowth. It was already over my head at that point. And here's walking into the area that had been cleared and the trees that haven't been cleared in the distance there. And you can see one of the trees that has been cleared on the ground there. And again, here's one of the trees that was pulled down six years earlier. And you know, the, the regrowth was already over, well over my head. And again, just another picture of the regrowth that's occurring. So the environment coming back, just left and coming back. This is an image uh, from near map from 2010. So here's the area that had been cleared. And basically, this is the most recent image from 2019. And you pretty well, it's you can't really see any difference uh, in the area that's cleared and the surrounding area. So the trees are coming right back. So that's an outcome for the council essentially the area they stopped the development sprawling further south that's bell creek again so effectively the action that council took in 2004 is still having outcomes for the environment the area is um, important for fisheries birds other wildlife uh, so you know there's a whole range of environmental outcomes achieved um, from that litigation back in 2004 if you went to the site now and didn't know the history you wouldn't know that those outcomes you know how hard it was for council to achieve that if you just walk through that site now you just basically see a whole heap of trees you wouldn't realize the fight that went in to keep them there so one of the lessons for regulators from this is that these cases provide yeah, a really important lesson in the quick reaction and initiative taken by officers from Caloundra City Council in acting to prevent a calculated breach of planning laws for commercial gain. And in areas under high development pressure such as the Sunshine Coast, it's important, critical, that councils are willing to take such strong action to deter development offences because otherwise developers have an incentive to contravene the law to obtain substantial commercial profits. Basically, yeah, if, it, if council hadn't acted strongly in this case, then the message is pretty 
quickly picked up by other developers that you could just go in if you know the law doesn't allow you to do it we'll just go in take the fine but then you get the big profits after that so the fine just becomes part of doing business so you need to stop it and come down strongly and in inappropriate cases i'm not suggesting that you know councillors should be you know overzealous or going in all the time and being oppressive it's not about that at all it's about uh, regulators being uh, strong and using um, quick um, decisive action where necessary and not just basically floating along thinking it's all going to be okay and that everyone is going to be reasonable that's not the real world the real world where there's a lot of money at stake uh, people will act unreasonably they will break the law to make that money if they think they can get away with it okay I'm going to go on to a second story, a smaller prosecution, but I want to bring out, so the, the previous prosecution was for a calculated breach for hundreds of millions of dollars involved. That's probably the top end um, of, you know, planning breaches and prosecutions. So that's the really high end stuff. There's a lot of just ordinary prosecutions that involve much less lower or much lower levels of um, fault of impact um, they can be messy and cluttered there's a lot of um, development of land that it is that are offenses basically because people don't understand the planning system they're confused they see what other people are doing around them and they think that that's what's accepted so they just do what their neighbors are doing so um, people can end up in a lot of trouble with that but, and it's quite common. So I just want to show you a sort of common offence. This is a Brisbane City Council prosecution from a decade ago. So this offence occurred in Virginia, so um, 20 kilometres sort of north of um, University of Queensland and northern part of Brisbane, just near the airport. So we focus in uh, on Virginia. I'm going to focus in on that area. You can see essentially it's an industrial area, um, quite messy. Uh, and then the green that you see there to in the bottom right is a golf course, the Virginia golf course. So I'm going to focus in on the land in that circle. And that the boundaries of the block are shown there in white. So uh, if we go down to ground level, these are pictures I took because I acted for the defendant in this case. And uh, I just, the first thing I did when... I was briefed in it was say okay let's meet out out on site have a walk around so I met the solicitor out there and we walked around on site and this is a series of pictures I took walking back across the property so this is from the road looking in and then this is just down a little driveway to the side you can see the house there on the left and then basically the pictures I'm going to show you are walking in on this road and just taking pictures of what's going on so the land occupier was a company that um, did roadworks, so repaired, they were a private company, but they repaired roads. So they had a whole heap of trucks and they had um, facilities for fixing the trucks and dealing with the material that they were ripping up from roads and then going and, and putting down on roads. So we walked back in. This is a shed they had for repairs to their machinery. And this is it looking from a different angle. You can see it's a very messy site. Uh, immediately, if you're a regulator, you look at something like this, which has probably got oil in it. Uh, there's no bunding around it. So typically in that sort of structure on a well-managed site, you would see a little wall around the base. So if there's a leak from that sort of tank, it shouldn't just flow out on the ground. It should flow out into a bunded area and it shouldn't escape just you know into a local water course or whatever. So this is a messy, poorly managed site. What they were doing in this shed was repairing their trucks. So in planning terms, that's called the motor vehicle workshop. Garage is a common term, but motor vehicle workshop is much more uh, in a planning terms. That's a sort of defined use that you see. So they built this shed, uh, no approval for building the shed where they were just basically um, storing their machinery in. And then going back further on the site, this is some of the materials they had. This is some of their clean material that's going out for, you know, working on roads. And then over here is some of the material that they ripped up. You can see the bitumen in it. And basically the next image is going to be walked back through all this rubble. 
to the back of the site and those trees that you can see this is looking back across those piles that we just looked at in the last photograph and these trees here which were uh, not native trees they were Chinese elms so weed trees um, but they're in a watercourse so we ended up getting a, um, an offense for um, there were three trees <laughs> ended up getting one offense for each tree um, here's my solicitor and this is the um, occupier of the land you know they've got heaps of machinery they just basically pushed material back to give themselves more area to work in so in development terms that's the filling of land or operational works so and then there's a watercourse over here so you can see looking out on the watercourse it's full of weeds but it's still a watercourse so if you looked at the planning the planning scheme at the time um, you can see the block of land in yellow there the front part closest to the road was in the future industry area and then the back part was in an environmental protection area for the watercourse so that was the zoning it was called areas at the time under brisbane city council's planning scheme what would now be called zones so part of this a part of the site is future industry part of the site is environmental protection but basically the development is occurring pretty well right to the back corner so where the environment protection um, area is probably where that line is the shed isn't shown in this google earth image but the shed had been built pretty well across the two areas so the history of what happened the site didn't have any development approvals but it had previously been used for light industry the company bought the property in 2006 and they just started using it as the base for their asphalt repair operations around brisbane the premises were the location of the company office parking for trucks used in road repairs storage materials a motor vehicle workshop and an employee car park so brisbane city council investigated possible offenses in early 2008 and then they issued they initially issued a show cause notice so that's a administrative notice but no fine at that stage saying basically you know what you're doing is potentially an offense tell us why you know justify what you're doing um, the company didn't respond so then council went on and charged them with 13 offenses and then that's when i was involved I won't name the company but i'm just using the facts so what laws regulate the activity if it occurred today so we've already talked about the main offences under the Planning Act. Carrying out accessible development without a permit is a, is a common one. Um, compliance with the development approval. Well, there's no development approval in this case. Uh, so that one's not going to be relevant. But unlawful use of a premises is um, also potentially re relevant. So you've got the material change of use um, for motor vehicle workshop and those sorts of things. Um, but use as well is a... Um, another potential offence, unlawful use. So has a development offence been committed if we assume the same facts occurred today? Uh, let's just say from council's perspective we say yes. Well, what should we do in this case? Um, the context was that uh, our client had basically was negligent. They looked around, they saw what others were doing around them. And they pretty well copied it was an industrial area they just assumed that they could do you know do sort of industrial activity they didn't get proper approvals um, they were a small small fairly small company but basically they just did what others were doing around them and the problem was that a lot of the their neighbors were also in breach and council pretty well just went along the road and gave uh, enforcement notices to all of their neighbors including them so they just got got sort of caught up in the sweep so from council's perspective this is an offense that's occurring you know multiple offenses in this area and they're basically trying to get um, land holders back into compliance with the planning scheme and there's multiple things that are going on here and it's pretty yeah it's you know it's a pretty messy area um, but if you look at um, prosecution policy, so Brisbane City Council has got a prosecution policy. The most recent version is 2019. This, the, the key criteria for determining what to do and whether to prosecute is built around the concept of the public interest and the sorts of um, criteria for determining the public interest are things like the seriousness of the alleged offence and its impact on the environment, the intent, um, the attitude, of the offender the measures that they've taken to prevent it occurring 
and the measures that they've taken to minimize the impact of the offense, the history. So this is um, all consistent with what I said before about the enforcement period pyramid. You, your response as a regulator is determined by three big issues, the harm that's occurred, the fault, and the remediation effort. Um, wrap that up in the concept of the public interest. Here, you know, the, the harm that's occurring is, let's just say it's material, it's not, you know, it's not the worst offence, there's not, you know, this World Heritage Area that's been destroyed or something, it's a pretty messy site in a fairly messy area that's affected by a lot of weeds, it's environmental values are, are, are low, but they're not, they're not, there's still environmental values there associated with the creek. From a planning perspective, council is trying to basically improve compliance in the whole area and protect things like creek. They want to get a lot of landholders into compliance. So um, the fault is it's really negligence. It's, it just, it's just a small operator that looked around, didn't mean to do the wrong thing, but also didn't take you know, enough steps to ensure that they were in compliance. So there is fault there. The remediation effort, you know, they were, it was an ongoing activity. They didn't respond to the enforcement notice or the um, show cause notice. So then council just goes, well, next step, criminal prosecution. So in this case, um, BCC initially issued a show cause notice and after they didn't respond, they charged them with 13 offenses. Here's a list of the offenses, charges one to three. Um, three of them, charges nine, 10, 11, were related to a local law about damaging protected vegetation and it related to three elm trees, these Chinese elm trees, um, so weed species, in that watercourse. They gave a f an offence for one for each tree, which I thought was just over the top, but um, that's what councillor did. There's a couple of offences related to um, the environmental protection laws, but there's a whole heap related to planning laws what are now sections 165 and 163. So unlawful use, carrying out accessible development without a permit, things like the motor vehicle workshop was a material change of use when they started it. They didn't have approval for that. Uh, it was accessible development under the planning scheme. They, yeah, there was an offence there. Um, using the house as an office, a uh, range of other things, filling, so operational works. Um, yeah, so yeah, whole range of things going on here. So actually, I don't think there's an operational works offence there. It's all about use. And then they're saying the unlawful storage of fill stockpiling. So they didn't charge them with a um, op works offence. Um, but anyway, and here's down here is the construction of the shed. So they didn't have any permits for building the shed. So there's a whole range of offences there. The details aren't important. What I really want to bring out with this story is the fact that this is just your run-of-the-mill, small operator, messy situation, regulator coming in, there's a lot of other offences going on in the area and you just go in and you're trying to clean things up and trying to get people into compliance with your planning scheme and enforce you know, better controls, protection of watercourses, those sorts of things. Well, the outcome, uh, the company, so we looked at you know, were they liable, Yes was a simple answer. So we negotiated with council, ultimately pleaded guilty to eight charges of the 13. They were fined $18,000. The company decided that the site was just too problematic. So they moved to another site with proper planning approvals for its operations um, and they rehabilitated the site. So from council's perspective, from a regulator's perspective, well, that's a good outcome. They've got a fine. It's not an enormous fine, but basically they've got this site now into compliance. They've shut down a a non-complying uh, operation. So this is just a bit of a postscript. Um, this is the site in 2010 and this um, yeah, shows the site just after it had been cleaned up and my client had left. So this area has all been cleared of the rubble that was there. I think another company had come in and was using it by now. The shed has also had been there and that's been pulled down. I think the shed might, it was either here or here. So the shed's gone. Um, the motor vehicle work, well, the shed that the motor vehicle workshop was in is still there, but if it's not being used as a motor vehicle workshop, well, there's no offense. And then that house is still there at the front. Now, um, 
a year later, someone else was using it. Uh, and it seems to be some sort of operation that uh, had a whole heap of material in um, shipping containers or some sort of um, containers. So they're still using the site. Uh, I wasn't involved at that stage. I can't really tell what was, you know, what approvals they had. Um, council would have, you know, presumably was right onto the site. So um, what happened though after that in 2013 was that the owners just, you know, demolished the house, demolished the shed, and then uh, clearly there was a whole application process to um, fill the site. And what they built then was a big concrete hard stand area with a big shed on it. Uh, so this is in 2017, what the site looked like. And then in 2019, the most recent near map image, this is the site. Uh, so that company apparently bought, a company bought it and they just coming down to street level. This is just a street view image looking in. So they've raised, they would have gotten an approval for filling the site to lift it up for flooding problems from the creek. And there's a big open-ended shed there. It appears to be a company that does some sort of um, building waste transfer. Um, and it goes through that, um, presumably they're recycling some material, sending off, it seems to be some sort of transfer station and a fairly big operation. So this is what it looked like in 2008 and looking in uh, through that driveway. Um, now, this is what it looks like. So it's been filled and there's a shed there. Uh, you know, it's not a pretty site, but it was never going to be that. It's an industrial area. It's gone from being in an area that was poorly managed with, you know, trucks being um, worked on, no doubt oil and stuff being spilt on the ground, pretty badly managed to being a, a now a well-managed site, um, concrete hard stand area, a shed. They're doing some sort of industrial activity there, waste transfer. So from a planning outcome, if you think about this from Brisbane City Council's perspective, where you know not every site is pristine, you've got to have industrial areas, you've got to basically manage the whole city. There's a whole range of things that have got to be got to be done to make a city work. So this site over 10 years has gone from non-complying and a whole range of problems to what looks like to me to be a well-managed site um, that yeah is a much um, better use for an industrial area, a much better managed site. So you can see there some good planning outcomes um, over the time of the last decade since the offence occurred. And, and obviously they didn't just all flow from the um, prosecution, but you know these sorts of outcomes are an indirect uh, outcome of the prosecution. You get basically better management of land in your local government area. So these are good outcomes from a planning perspective, from a regulatory perspective. These are the sorts of outcomes that you want to achieve. Okay, I might just take a pause for a moment. Uh, I'm going to go on to a third story, but just uh, probably good for anyone listening in. Take a pause. Um, go and have a I'm going to discard my notes. I'm just going to pause the recording. So take a break and uh, come back in a few minutes. Uh, go up, get yourself a cup of coffee or a Coke or something. Uh, come back and listen uh, on to the stories. But yeah, important to take a break. So welcome back. Just before we had a break, we were talking about a prosecution for uh, a company in Brisbane for essentially a messy development site. I just want to turn to now to a third story, which is another prosecution, this time for unlawful clearing of mangroves at Maribara. And this story really brings out, uh, again, how people can make mistakes in the planning system and misunderstand what they can and can't do with their land. And yeah, that, that can result in prosecution and significant fines. So this story involves Maribara, which is a city a few hours north of Brisbane, just inland from Fraser Island. So if we focus in on it, you can see Fraser Island there and Maribara shine. I'm going to focus in on the red circle. Adjacent to Maribara is uh, the Great Sandy Strait, which is a Ramsar listed uh, site in Harvey Bay up there. So really, really important fisheries values uh, feeding into the Great Sandy Strait uh, that Maribara is um, built around is a river called the Mary River that 
bends up through Maryborough. So uh, the next slide shows the Mary River coming in here. And the site I'm going to focus on is right in, in well, near to the city uh, in this bend in the river. So the next slide here, you can see the Mary River. So flowing this way. And the site that um, the offence occurred on is here. Just focusing in on it, here's the site of the mangrove clearing. And uh, the, this image is from 2010 after the clearing occurred. So you can see here what there were mangroves all the way along the bank and there's been clearing in this section. Now, here's another image just a bit closer. You can see there that there's a big sort of um, gap and then there are mangroves out in the river and you might think, what was going on there? Well, what was happening, if we come down to ground level, this is an image taken by Queensland Voting Fishery Patrol Officer in 2009 down at ground level. So basically if I go back, this image is, you can see these little floating things down here. This image is taken here and I'll show you another image taken about here in a moment looking back that way. So this is from those little floating pontoons. And essentially what the developer had done was use an excavator that could reach out from the land and um, basically dig out the mangroves then put them into a truck and take them away. And the mangroves that are left there are simply, he couldn't reach them with the excavator, but obviously they plan to, to bring in a barge uh, and have, an ex have the excavator on a barge and clear out those mangroves. It was just that they were stopped before that, that occurred. And they'd built this revetment um, wall out of timber uh, to stop the bank collapsing. So this is looking back. Uh, with those little floating pontoons just here and that's what the mangroves would have looked like before so all of this area here would have had mangroves and it's all been cleared so the chronology for this offence in 2005 a development application was lodged for marina under the then planning legislation the integrated planning act then it was approved in 2006 subject to conditions in 2007 the person, the developer who'd gotten the approval, sold it to a company that purchased the land for $3.15 million and that was the company that ultimately became the defendant in the prosecution. So that was 2007 they bought it. In July 2008 they started construction of the marina wall and progressively cleared the mangroves and essentially it was the defendant, the company um, owner and a em single employee and they essentially did it themselves. So they're operating the machinery. Uh, they didn't have any construction firms involved. They didn't involve planners. So they pretty well just bought it. They bought it with an approval and they, they misunderstood uh, that the approval didn't give them uh, authority to clear the mangroves. So in 2009, the Queensland Burning Fisheries Patrol, which is responsible for protecting fisheries and including dealing with um, mangrove uh, clearing offences because mangroves are important fish habitat. So they in inspected the site and a prosecution resulted from that. So just to flesh that out a little bit, the development application that was lodged in 2005 was about 20 pages long and it included a checklist where it dealt with fisheries matters and the application indicated that there would be no destruction removal of mangroves. They said none of the above. So that meant that it wasn't actually assessed by the fisheries department because they were applying to do, you know, it's an applicant driven process. What they were applying for, they said they didn't need to clear mangroves. So it was never assessed by fisheries and no conditions were imposed upon it by fisheries about the clearing of mangroves. So the approval, the application didn't, didn't uh, apply to clear mangroves and the approval then didn't address those issues specifically in response to an information request they said down here in this dot point that the there is no proposed disturbance of marine plants or disturbance um, of tidal lands within or adjacent to the site so basically what they were doing this is what the the applicant's proposal to do sorry the applicant's proposal was was to build a marina so here's the the boundary of the land with the river and that what they were going to do was build floating pontoons out into the river. So a series of them, one, two, three, 
four, five, six, seven floating pontoons um, connected with a floating walkway. And they were going to have these little ramps that went down to the floating pontoons on the other side of the mangroves. So their proposal was, this is the bank um, with the floating pontoons going down that it's fixed to. And then they don't show the mangroves here, but essentially the mangroves would be you know, underneath those floating pontoons and they, they were proposing that they would just position them so to avoid the mangroves that were there. So that was the proposal that was approved. And then attached to the approval was uh, conditions, which is the typical case. And as is normal, the uh, assessment manager and the concurrence agencies take the plans that have been submitted by the applicant and they when they approve the, the project, the first condition is typically to take those plans and attach them to the approval and say, you, might, you, you got approval to um, carry out what you applied for. And um, they attach the plans so that they become very prescriptive. Uh, so the, you know, the applicant applied for this, uh, for, you know, for a marina, built in that way that was what it was assessed so as the regulator the local government and the state government in assessing it you that's what you're assessed that's what you want to approve so you take that plan and you say uh, you're approved um, and when you carry it out you must carry it out in accordance with the approved plans and then they attach copies of those and then that gives them some very specific detailed uh, prescriptive requirements completely reasonable though if you think about it because this is what the applicant applied to do so to, they've given approval for what they applied to do you then attach the plans to the approval that's completely reasonable because all they're doing is saying you know you've got to do it as you asked us to, um, you know what you asked for is what we what we're approving and that's what you've got to do so that there can't be any dispute if they just approved a marina and then later down the track the applicant you know, builds a marina in a different way. And then there's a fight over, well, that's not what we assessed. The conditions are a really important check then. So it gives it a specific, you know, what, what is approved is very specific. So that's normal practice. And uh, it comes to a point I make at the end of this lecture is that normally when you interpret an approval, you normally interpret them as a standalone document. So you interpret them uh, you don't go back to the application and work out what was applied for. You you look at the approval, and if it cross references to some document, well, that document can be referred to. But if it's not cross referenced and specifically referred to, you can't refer to other documents to interpret it unless it's absolutely necessary. So by necessary implication. So generally, approvals are interpreted as a standalone document. So knowing that rule that's a really important then that councils uh, attach copies of relevant maps or refer to them so that's why there's a reference to it in the approval okay so this is the approved site plan attached to the approval it's exactly what the applicant applied for i'm just going to focus in on this next little bit to bring it up so here was an existing wharf and you can see here here's the gangway and here's the the shoreline or the um, riverbank and the mangroves would be located in between the floating walkway and the riverbank. They didn't apply to clear any mangroves, but the person that bought it, looking at these plans, thought they did. Uh, these were also the um, sections that were attached to the approved plan. So this is what was approved. And I'm just going to focus in on this little bit of writing here. So the person that bought it only got a copy of the development application with this map attached as an A4 sheet, so a normal page. The original approved plan though was on A3 and you can actually read these words here. So just think about it, this person spent $3 million and they didn't even get a, pro a, a copy of the approval that was legible. If you actually read the notes, then Note 15 said the pontoon will in no way involve the disturbance, removal, destruction or damage of any marine plant. So given that there was a condition saying they must generally comply with the plans, then 
because of this note, you could say, well, because they have destroyed marine plans, marine plants, they haven't complied with the approved plans. So there's a breach of a condition there. So what laws regulate the activity, uh, assuming it occurred today? So they didn't apply originally to clear marine plants. Uh, so they didn't have any approval for that. So operational works involving the destruction or removal of um, marine plants is accessible development at a state level under the uh, planning regulations. So they didn't have a de development permit that covered that aspect of the development. So they would be in breach of section 163. Also, they could be in breach of 164 because you know the related, um, that little note, even though the approval wasn't specifically for marine plants, the note would be give you enough to say, well, there's a breach of a condition to comply with the approved plans. There's also a related offence under the Fisheries Act for destroying marine plants, but it is uh, linked to the planning regime. So if you had a development permit to destroy marine plants, then it would be a lawful uh, destruction of marine plants, so you wouldn't commit an offence against section 123. So the key question in this case was well, what did the development permit allow the developer to do? They argued that I, I acted for the fisheries department, so I was the prosecutor in this case. So uh, in the last uh, story I told you I was acting for the defendant. In this case I was acting for the prosecutor, so one of the, the great things about acting in you know, the private sector or as a barrister, you know, as a lawyer, you act for many different parties and you get different perspectives on, on things. So here I was the prosecutor and we had to show that the approval under the fishery, sorry, under the, um, the planning legislation at the time didn't include marine plants or didn't include approval to clear marine plants. So we looked back at the uh, application documents to basically show that you know that that none of that was considered none of it was part of the approval it didn't the approval on its face did not cover marine plants so has an offense been committed well yes what enforcement options are open well in this case if we think about our enforcement the harm that's been committed is substantial it's again it's not a you know, it, this, these fisheries values are important. They're, they're important for um, nearby Ramsar wetlands uh, and, you know, the, the very significant uh, environmental values associated with the Mary River. So protecting uh, mangroves along it for fish habitat is important. So there is you know, substantial harm. It's not, you know, the world's greatest offence by any means. It's, you know, 100 metres of, of mangroves, you know, it's it's far from trivial, but at, at the same, you know, the same token, it's not, you know, the Exxon Valdez disaster destroying a pristine area with, you know, massive amounts of pollution. You know, it's it's on a scale of one to ten, I would say, you know, a two or a two or a three, probably even less, you know, a two, maybe a one, you know, but it's it's so it's not enormous, but there's harm there. And it's in, it's in a sensitive area. The fault, the fault in this case was really negligence. They misunderstood what the law allowed them to do. They thought they had approval. They thought they were doing everything according to law, but they, you know, they didn't engage any planners. It's a very complicated environment. They were pretty, you know, it was, it was pretty um, stupid what they did. So stupidity was really the fault element here. In terms of the remediation effort, um, they weren't remediating anything because they were saying what they had done was lawful. So there was a prosecution uh, of them, and uh, yeah, well, Fisheries decided to prosecute, going for a fine. What penalties are then likely to be imposed by a court is an issue I just wanted to, to touch on. So in this sort of case, how do you determine what penalty to impose? Should it be $1,000? Should it be, you know, how do you come up with a, a penalty for this? So we went to court, or the fisheries went to court. They were found guilty of uh, a development offence. You then come to the sentence to be imposed. 
And in these sorts of cases, the point I wanted to make here is that proving commercial benefit is the basis for a large penalty. So in this case, I was the prosecutor and the defendant gave evidence. And so after he had given evidence saying he thought what he did was lawful and he you know, wanted the best for the community and he thought that the marina was an important development, it was important for the development of Maribara. <coughs> My first question to him when... He, so he gives his evidence... <coughs> excuse me. He gives his evidence and then... Uh, me as a prosecutor, I, I get the chance to ask him questions. So I said so thank you to the judge. The judge has just said, okay, your, your turn, Mr. McGrath. Uh, I said, thank you, Your Honor. Um, Mr. Blythe, he was the defendant. You purchased the land for $3.15 million, you said, in your evidence in chief and the documents that were placed before the court. Now, if the development is able to be built, the marina for 140 berths, and you want to sell it, what would you be hoping in present dollar terms you'd be able to sell it for? And he says, could I give a range? And I say, sure. And then he says, I think 10 to 15. And I'm like, million dollars? Yeah, maybe more, he says. So uh, he just shouldn't have given evidence for this. We didn't have any evidence of what the value of the land was other than you know, what he told us. I didn't know what the commercial value of, it, of the land was. I knew that uh, he had purchased it for $3.15 million. So I was looking to get you know, the word millions of dollars into the judge's you know, before the judge. So when we came to sentence that the judge would be thinking, well, there's got to be a substantial fine because of the commercial element here. Uh, and yeah, 10 to 15 was beyond what I had, you know, dared to hope for. So I go on, okay, that's fine. So if you fully develop the site with the boat selling center, the ship's channel, these are all things that he wanted to do on the site, a restaurant, and then you sell it, what would be the value you think of the property? Um, what would you aim for? And he says, I would think maybe 30 million. So is that with the land, the birth, so is it? And he says, everything. So I, I didn't ask many questions after that because I'd gotten everything I needed. Um, we were going to argue that his belief that he could do the development was a mistake of law. And therefore, you know, that's not an excuse. If you get the law wrong, it's not an excuse. It can be something that's taken into account in mitigating your sentence, but... It's not an excuse for the offence. And I needed evidence to show, to basically have the judge thinking about you know, a serious fine. I think that the maximum fine we could get was something like $400,000 in that case. I can't remember the exact amount of that time. But anyway, the company was convicted and $162,000 fine was imposed. So that was the result. So that's just an, an example of calculating you know what offense what what numbers to you know attach to it if we thought back to the first case with pelican links where they're going for hundreds of millions of dollars in profit and there was very high levels of fault uh, you know the fine in that case would have to be in the millions of dollars to make it um, you know to, to really reflect the gravity of the offense in this case because the fault was stupidity rather than active malice, um, $162,000 really reflected the commercial aspects of the development and really was just trying to um, find an appropriate um, fine that would deter him from doing this again, but also deter others from doing this. Because one of the important things with courts is when they sentence, they're sentencing for the individual before them, but there's also a public messaging that's going on to deter others from doing similar things. So private deterrence and public deterrence is two things that are talked about in sentencing. So just as a side issue, I just wanted to mention, so if you act for an offender, so let's just say you get out and you're working and your client uh, is you know, potentially being charged with an offence, what um, should you do? I just wanted to say to you that, well, the first thing you should do is, you know, get a, you know, they should get a lawyer involved that you're in, you know, it's not, it's beyond your training to really be giving them advice on it. But I just wanted to mention while, while you need a lawyer, there's two broad ways that uh, people can defend being charged or being investigated. One way is the, the traditional criminal lawyer's approach of tell them nothing, take them nowhere. So give no assistance to the police or the prosecution. You might do that, 
but if you think about how regulators work, if you get in and try and fix up the problem and you work with them and you, uh, you, know, you, you put in place management plans to avoid them happening again, you know that environmental regulators have got a lot of things that they can do. They don't necessarily have to prosecute you. So if you can give them other, you know, some good reasons not to prosecute you, uh, like present management plans to them, apologize, say, look, we made a mistake. Um, this won't happen again. We're now putting in place better management plans so that, you know, this is fixed and won't reoccur. Firstly, you might, in the exercise of discretion, they might decide not to prosecute you. But if you, the company does, you know, the developer does get prosecuted, you can then use those things as for a second time for a plea and mitigation to reduce the fine that's imposed. So you can say, well, we're sorry, uh, Your Honour, we've, we've um, stuffed up, you know, an offence has occurred, we accept that, but we've put in place systems to avoid this happening in the future, uh, and we accept that we should be fined, but the fine should be, you know, substantially reduced because we've done all this work, we spent $50,000 fixing up the site, we've spent, you know, $20,000 doing a new management plan, so it's already cost us $70,000, uh, in addressing the problem, that's a penalty in its own right, and then the judge takes that into account in reducing the fine that's imposed. So my view is generally um, to, you know, if I'm contacted by a defendant about, you know, or a solicitor about um, prosecution, get in and work out has an offence occurred, uh, and then talk with the client about the approach that, you know, there's the wisest approach to take and often that can be basically owning up to the offence and putting in place management plans to avoid it happening in the future and that can be a wise approach going forward um, yeah just that's just an aside okay postscript to this case so here's the land in 2010 you can see the mangroves there in the gap uh, a few years later 2016 the mangroves are coming back Marina hasn't gone ahead, uh, 2000, oh, this should be 2019, not 2010. Uh, so 2019, the uh, November 2019, so only a few months ago, the site, the mangroves has pretty well come back. Uh, the marina hasn't gone ahead. Okay, final story, fourth story. I want to use this story to, uh, so uh, a number of the stories to this point have involved breaches of conditions. The first story about uh, Pelican Lynx was a breach of conditions, and the last story about uh, the Maribara uh, clearing of mangroves also involved a breach of conditions. So we looked at some of the conditions in that last story. So originally when I did this lecture, I had this story at the, at the start, this Sincere International, and I went through the technical details about conditions. And I just felt it was better to leave it to the end because now hopefully you can understand the context of um, the problem that we're dealing with, which is regulating development that's been approved or and also areas where people have misunderstood uh, what they are able to do on land. Uh, and so I want to give you some practical guidance and I've got a handout um, with some key points sort of wrapping up that sort of practical guidance. But I want to just flesh out the the issue about, okay, so we've been talking about conditions. So what can regulators impose conditions for? What are the rules about conditions? And a recent decision of the Planning Environment Court involving a company called Sincere International and Gold Coast City Council is a good example of the principles for conditions. So this case involved development of land uh, at the Gold Coast. So about an hour, if you drove an hour south from Brisbane, come to the Gold Coast at Oxenford. So focusing in on the red circle uh, and going to zoom in on that red circle. The land involved is within this red circle and essentially uh, involved a proposal. You're going to see a map in a moment that's like a dumbbell that looks like that. So that's the space that's proposed to be developed. You can see the context is there's a lot of urban development around in this area, lots of houses 
and there's a golf course um, just above it. And so the landowner wants to develop more houses in this area and they propose this. So I'll just go back for a second to so see that dumbbell within the circle. So this is the dumbbell here. So they're proposing uh, a subdivision, so a reconfiguration of a lot to create uh, 67 um, community title lots. So uh, with common property, so big body corporate uh, in that area. And then there were two balance lots. So the two numbers of them are 901 and 900. And what the developer proposed was to give, well, it wasn't just that they proposed it, they knew that council in approving it would want some area set aside for nature conservation and parks in accordance with council policies and normal practices. So they proposed that 901, that lot would be given to council as a park. Uh, they were proposing to use 900 for you know future development. So they didn't want council to have 900, but they were happy with 901. So that was their proposal, but council wanted both lot 900 and 901. So it wanted both and it sought to impose a condition um, requiring both of them to be dedicated. And so there was a fight over that. So focusing in, here's the land, here's those two blocks. You can see that 901 is basically vegetated. 900 has already been cleared. The next image I'm gonna show you is taken from this roundabout. So this is just looking across to what is um, in the foreground or just beyond that little rise would be lot 900. And then the trees in the background would be on lot 901. So under the planning scheme, the whole area was shown as low density residential. So that's, you can see the dumbbell there. It's all shown as low density residential. So the development of this area as a residential development was consistent with the planning scheme. So we know from previous lectures, that means they're gonna get approved. But the conditions that can be imposed upon them is what's in dispute here, not the approval itself, but the conditions attached to the approval. So from the developer's perspective, you know, there'd be millions of dollars worth of development here. The lot 900 and its potential for future development, maybe as a store for, for whatever could go there, uh, is, you know, would be millions of dollars as well. So when you've got that sort of money at stake, it's often well worth going to court from a developer's perspective. So another important thing to realize with the planning scheme that was very important in the dispute was that while the land was shown as residential, a large part of it was also covered by um, a, an overlay for environmental significance. So the area of lot 901 was all shown as uh, environmental significance. 900 though wasn't in the overlay. Admittedly, a lot of the land that's being developed is in shown as an area of environmental significance and no doubt council could bring back lot 900 to, you know, to have um, greater, um, you know, plant trees and those sorts of things. So, but a key, a key thing to the decision was it wasn't shown as on the overlay for environmental significance and it went to court and essentially that was a determining factor for the judge. So the judge went through the tests for approval and I'll just show you the section he referred to. So section 65 in the Planning Act says that uh, development condition imposed on a development approval must be relevant to but not an unreasonable imposition on the development and B, or sorry, or B, be reasonably required in relation to the development. So relevant to means that it is within the uh, jurisdiction or within the uh, area of responsibility of the government that's imposing the condition. That's effectively what relevant to means. So local governments have a broad area of jurisdiction or responsibility. So they pretty well are responsible for the, the proper planning and management of their local government areas. So they can impose conditions dealing with stormwater, uh, management with noise, with roads, with environmental protection, with pretty well anything that's relevant to um, the community, they will have some sort of jurisdiction or responsibility over. 
that's not the issue here. It's not an issue that they um, have responsibility for environmental protection. The issue whether it is, is, was whether it was reasonable to require both lots to be given over. And the judge looked at the evidence and decided that no, it wasn't reasonably required to have lot 900 given over. So the judge uh, threw out um, that part of the conditions and yeah, sent them. I just mentioned that the approval package is available on the Blackboard site uh, and I've gotten that from the court website. So with these sorts of cases, you can get all of the documents. So that's where I got it from. And basically, if you look at the approval package, I'd really like you to have a quick look at the conditions. They're only 13 pages long. The actual document's got a big lot of attachments to it. That's no doubt linked to that principle that generally to um, be able to refer to a document, it's either be, got to be expressly referred to or incorporated into the approval. So they've incorporated a whole heap of attachments uh, to the approval, but the actual approval and the conditions is only 13 pages long. It deals with um, approved plans and the stand, standard sorts of things. Um, and notice here that it says what is approved, the development permit for the reconfiguration of the lot, it also says what other approvals are needed. So that's the sort of um, a mechanism that's built in to alert people that are reading this that there are f further approvals needed. So if you think about the situation with that fellow up in Maryborough who had an approval, thought he could clear mangroves, but actually the approval didn't cover that. So that's, you know, these sorts of expl explanations about the further things that you will need can be useful in avoiding people stuffing up in interpreting the approval. So uh, those are the sorts of things that are going on in the approval. It's good to have a look at it. And, but I want to just focus on the condition that was in dispute. So section, sorry, condition seven was about the land transfer. It said required that as a condition of the approval that the uh, owner would transfer at no cost to council the land identified as um, well, condition two was about amalgamating lots 900 and 901, and then they wanted the amalgamated two lots transferred to council. But um, the Planning Environment Court rejected that and said, well, lot 900 shouldn't be transferred. So the ultimate condition that was approved by the court was what council had sought, except that they've dropped out lot 900. So that's a substantial change. Um, but yeah, that's the result, you know, and worth the outcome of this case is worth millions of dollars to the developer, which is why, you know, people don't go to court to fight over, you know, small trivial things because there's a lot of money in going to court. But this is the sort of case where it's well worth going to court to have a fight. So in conclusion, there's some key um, practical lessons about conditions that I want to draw out. And as I said, I initially did this lecture and put all of this stuff at the front and then talked through the stories but I just felt that that was a pretty clunky way to start and I hope that this long lecture with all these stories now fills you in on if you haven't worked in the development sector the sorts of issues and why um, conditions are important and also how people can misinterpret their approvals so the practical lessons that I've given you on the handout um, are really drawn from these sorts of cases but the four stories don't cover, cover every point but have a read of the handout um, and I just wanted to really emphasize for you that yeah, conditions and enforcement powers are relevant to your work either if you work for government or in the private sector because if you're working for local or state government you, you might be involved in writing or enforcing conditions if you're working in the private sector then you have to interpret what they mean and often you'll be negotiating with government about them so understanding them is important. Conditions are normally imposed at the decision part. So they can be really expensive and they're regularly challenged by developers. So the Sincere International case is a great example of that. It's worth millions of dollars, whether that land lot 900 was given to council or not. So well worth going to court. And I really want you to understand the major tests for validity, so what is relevant and reasonable, and some of the other um, important uh, subsidiary tests about finality and the like. 
Uh, I just mentioned though that that in practice you're not going to go out, you know, when you graduate and have to work with, you know, or develop your, you know, a full set of conditions yourself. Um, in practice, people copy a lot, so you'll typically look at past examples of conditions. Most big organisations like the Department of Environment and Science or Brisbane City Council or Gold Coast have standard conditions or or previous examples of conditions, and you typically start by copying across previous conditions and then working working them up so you don't need to be an expert in creating comprehensive lawful set of conditions you know from the first day you you know you, you graduate um, and you probably never have to be able to do that even 20 years into your career but it's still important that you're aware of the fundamentals for what makes a lawful condition um, and think about it this way a bit like a rubik's cube while you don't start from scratch a deeper and more 3d understanding of conditions is useful for any work involving them it's sort of like solving a rubik's cube because there's many different combinations uh, often there's you know no one right or wrong and there's debates a lot about conditions uh, and how they should be written so i've given you a two-page handout that's available uh, on the website also uh, there's a longer paper that you've got a link to um, on the website. It was a 14-page paper that I presented to a seminar last year for the Environment Institute of Australia and New Zealand. And it was, so it was presented to people who are working, um, both for government as well as for in the private sector. And it was about practical guidance for writing and interpreting conditions of approval. And the two-page handout really comes from that. And you can find that on the website uh, as well as a recording of that um, work seminar after work seminar so EINZ just as background there's a number of professional organizations that if you're working in the environment sort of sector you can join EIANZ -E is a good example of them so it covers everything from environmental managers through to lawyers through to town planners through to uh, engineers anyone that's working in like the environment sector can can join it it's a good organization does good training yeah it runs a whole range of things so it's you know good and it's good student fees you know good to join um, there's also other organizations like the planning institute of australia uh, or PIA, uh, which is good to join if you're a planner uh, another one is the queensland environmental law association which might sound like it's just for lawyers but it actually has a lot of environmental managers and planners involved in it sort of like uh, it's more legalistic than environment institute of australia and new zealand but you know similar sort of people might be involved and join members of both organizations uh, engineers also have you know a number of organizations as well so a number of these uh industry organizations they're good to join get involved with you know while you're a student they have good training and you know you meet good people through them okay so going then to the practical takeaway points from all of these stories and uh, download the handout these are all there so first off um, it's about being clear on exactly what you're applying for and what's approved and the story about the prosecution of that fellow up in Maryborough, who basically didn't understand what his approval covered and what it didn't. So it's quite common for, you know, it's a complex system. The development assessment system, the planning system is complex. People often get it wrong. So if you are writing um, an approval, you've got to recognize or you should recognize that people, you're trying to avoid confusion. So be clear about what's being approved and what's not. And if possible, you could put in what further approvals are needed, but then that you know, potentially runs the risk if you don't quite understand what they're applying for, you know, identifying a list of further approvals can be problematic as well. So bottom line, be clear on what is being applied for and what is being approved is fundamental to you know, assessing it and then writing the conditions. People can get it wrong. So in writing the approval and attaching conditions, the approval should clearly identify the activity that is approved and the conditions imposed upon the approval without a need to refer to the application. So generally, you should write the approval as a standalone document. 
that either cross-references any document incorporated into it, such as an approved plan, or attaches it. So the Sincere International example is one that attaches a lot of documents. It's physically part of the approval. In the Planning Act, the key tests are stated in Section 65. Conditions must be relevant um, and reasonably required. There's an esoteric debate about whether you should say or or and. I think you should basically think you require both conditions to be um, within the responsibility of the government that's imposing them, as well as reasonably required in the circumstances. So taking into account the fact of the development and the changes that it will produce, that the that it's a reasonable response in the circumstances. In the quizzes, um, if you so I've got a quiz that's linked to this lecture, and it asks you gives you questions with a set of facts like. Um, there's a development that's going to cause noise. Both experts agree that uh, a noise barrier that's five metres tall um, would meet Australian standards in terms of reducing noise to nearby residents. The council, though, imposes a requirement that a noise barrier be built that's 20 metres tall. Well, that's the sort of case where well, both experts are saying five metres is sufficient. A condition that said it's got to be 20 metres tall on the face of it looks unreasonable because the experts are saying 5, 20 is a lot more than 5. But um, flip that around, change the facts a bit, and um, the experts are saying that a noise barrier of 5 metres, both experts, so the developer's expert and the council's expert, say a noise barrier of 5 metres tall will be sufficient, and council imposes a condition requiring a noise barrier to be built of 5 metres in height. Well, on those facts, it looks reasonable in that both of the experts are saying that that's what's required. So go through the quizzes and it will help you understand relevant and reasonably required. And And I've given you some simple factual scenarios there. Have a think about it. There are important tests. I know they sound strange, but these are really significant for the whole um, development assessment process and you know the, the work in this sector. It involves a lot of work around conditions. Okay. A couple of other things um, that I would mention is that basically if you're looking, if you're working for regulators, don't get too stressed about the tests for conditions because basically you can think about the tests and the law as a bit like this. If you've actually got an environmental impact that you're trying to address, the law gives you a broad framework to address them. As long as it's reasonable, what you're doing, if you're trying to do the right thing, and you're trying to be reasonable, then you should be able to do it. You should be able to impose conditions on it. You can think of it like this. This is a good metaphor for it. The law gives you a frame within which you paint the picture of what the conditions require to be done. So you as a regulator, your job is to protect the community. That includes protecting the environment, having reasonable um, you know, standards for development. All of those things are your job. So if you're trying to do that, you know, the conditions that you write um, will, should um, pass the, the tests required by the law for them. Because the law is there about facilitating good development. It's not there to trap you or trip you up. Okay, another point, a uh, couple of points is about finality. Um, so this is a common uh, issue that um, the basic rule is that when a government gives an approval subject to the conditions, that the conditions should be final and they shouldn't require a further approval from the government unless it's something minor or incidental. That's the exception. So basically, the, the issue with finality is an approval should give you an approval, not a fake approval where you've got to come back in six months and get another approval before you can actually go ahead. So incidental things, just as an example, um, if, for instance, the um, imagine a big shopping center was being proposed for a site and a council approved it and they made a condition saying that the developer must prepare a landscaping plan um, for approval by council and that the landscaping plan must be um, implemented. 
So that's a later decision. But if you think about it in the context of a shopping center, the shopping center, you know, big developer, and they've got approval now for the shopping center. Landscaping is a relatively trivial issue. Mm -hmm. Another sort of common issue that's deferred to be the details to be worked out later is something like stormwater management. These are all things that are relatively trivial uh, and can be the details can be worked out later. So those things are commonly deferred for later approval uh, and don't infringe the rule about finality. So as long as it's minor or incidental, you can have later approvals. Um, again, have a go at the quizzes and have a think about that. The reason is that you know, there's a lot of work in preparing them and it costs money to prepare, say, a stormwater management plan. You've got to engage an engineer and, you know, there's all technical drawings. If in the, you know, you don't, as you as a developer, if you, you've got to spend a lot of money getting the approvals done and the big picture items you might deal with first. So first, will council allow us to have a shopping center here? If the answer to that is yes, then issues like stormwater management and landscaping can be worked out down the track but you don't need to put everything and spend the money right up front because you might you know, might get knocked back. So that would all be money you know, wasted. So minor things like that often get left to the future. Okay, so those are just a couple of practical points to be aware of. Uh, I've talked in the longer um, seminar paper about different approaches to writing conditions. I won't dwell upon that now. There's basically different concepts around how conditions should be written. I think though, don't get too caught up in that because the real issue is about really the level of detail that conditions um, impose. And there's essentially, there's this balance to be met between typically vague qualitative conditions uh, have the advantage of being simple, but then they're quite uncertain as to what exactly must be done and you know, so vague and simple also comes with the downs. Sorry, simple conditions, simple short conditions have the downside typically that there's uncertainty with them. Whereas detailed prescriptive conditions give you more certainty, but there's also the more complexity. So uh, there's no, often there's no perfect answer to conditions, and often conditions will have a range of prescriptive measures in them. Typically, they attach the maps that have been submitted by the, with the application. So those things are really common. So they're common prescriptive conditions. There's often a range of outcome-based conditions and the like. So often approvals will use a range of different approaches depending on the issue. And yeah, it's complex. Um, so have a look at the approval in Sasir International. That'll give you, I hope, a much better idea about this. I don't want to dwell upon the theory though. Um, yeah. It's a Goldilocks problem. There's no often no right answer. Um, so uh, I just want to wrap up. Uh, it would be really, really good if you go and try the online quiz about conditions to lock down your understanding of these main points. I, I really want you to get a practical understanding about condition making powers. And often you can't get that in the abstract. So go and have a look at the problems. Try and answer the quizzes and the quiz questions and then you'll see the answers. If you get them wrong, you can retry the quiz again. So can you spot unlawful conditions in Queensland's planning system? Have a go at the quiz, there's 10 questions. I hope that you find it really useful in locking down your understanding or practical understanding of this really important area. Okay, so that's the lecture. Four stories uh, around built around two big ideas. What can a regulator do if an offence occurs? and what conditions can a regulator impose on an approval. So important topics for your professional careers. So in terms of further reading, please download and skim read the first 13 pages of the conditions in Sincere International. It, this is such an important area for, for practice. So just I'd really like you to, to be aware of conditions and attempt the online quiz. It'll really help. Take home points, this is my final slide. I really want to emphasize that the Act, the Planning Act, provides a range of development offenses, of which the two most important in practice are carrying out accessible development without a permit and contravening conditions. Second point is environmental regulators, including local governments, typically have a range of enforcement options, allowing them to choose an appropriate response to an offenses. It's not just about sending people to jail. Typically, you want to protect the environment. You've got a whole range of tools to do that with. 
Third point is commercial benefit is a principal reason for development offences and removing this benefit is a principal focus of prosecutions and court sentences. So, yeah, important point. And finally, conditions are a common tool used to impose standards and constraints on development approvals granted under the Planning Act and other legislation. And there are important tests for the validity of conditions such as relevant and reasonless. And you really need to understand the basics of those mechanisms if you're going to work in this sector. Okay, that's the lecture. Thank you guys for listening. And I hope that that's really useful. And I hope that the stories made it interesting and you can see the relevance of the technical stuff at the end.